From the International Association of Marriage and Family Counselors, I'm Robert Caceres, and this is The Reframe. My guest today is Dr. Cheryl Mark. Dr. Mark is an assistant professor of counseling at Colorado Christian University and currently serves as IMFC's board member at large. She's a trained neurofeedback practitioner and a board-certified telemental health provider. Dr. Mark is also an EMDR-certified counselor, and she spoke with me about the rewarding nature of counseling clients who've experienced trauma. What I found out and discovered in using EMDR with my clients is that the reactivity from trauma, the hypervigilance, goes away. And specifically, when I started with many of, of the women in the shelter where I, where I first learned, what happened is that the distress would go down, but the positive beliefs that they would have about themselves, um, what they wanted to believe that originally felt completely false, would feel true. Instead of just like maybe knowing cognitively that something was true, but it was really being able to embrace it and feel it that this was really true. Many times after processing, someone would come back and something that had been troubling them for years, they'd come back and say, no, you know, that's, that's over now. It's just very rewarding to have someone who's committed to the entire process and who will stay with it and work it through and experience um, really transforming life change. Welcome to The Reframe. Over the next hour, you'll hear Dr. Mark discuss her prior work as a domestic violence counselor, describe her involvement in planning IMFC's annual conference, highlight the benefits and challenges associated with technology-assisted counseling, and offer tips for successfully completing an online graduate counseling program. Dr. Mark also describes how living in Europe shaped her appreciation for various cultures and enhanced her counseling practices. I, I learned humility and to enter into all of the relationships there, realizing that I may not be fully understood, and I might not fully understand them, but it was worth trying. And I learned that I could be connected to and learn from people who were very different from myself. And I also learned that there are many valuable cultures and many ways to do things, and that my thoughts and ideas are just that, they're mine and just one way. And I need to remain open to other people's experiences and ideas. And so this has helped me listen to and understand clients and keeping an open mind and an open heart is important. I began our conversation by asking Dr. Mark to share about her path to the counseling profession. When my oldest of three sons started university, I decided that I wanted to return to school to pursue a master's degree as a counselor to help families, and this was back in 2001. So I was an adult learner both in my 40s and then again in my 50s when I returned to school for a PhD. And back when I got my start in the profession, in the communities around me, I saw families breaking apart and I wanted to do something to um, help families heal. My father's also had a big influence in my life as far as pursuing the counseling profession. When I was four years old, he went back for his doctorate from the University of Illinois, and I can remember him studying, and I can remember my mom typing his dissertation. And he was an educator and a trainer, and he established the counseling center at the University of Illinois Chicago Circle Campus. So counseling was something that was normal in our family. And I was brought up learning to use um, when you X, I feel X uh, style of communication in our family. And also um, what drew me to the counseling profession was um, my husband and I sought out counseling when we needed help and it was very beneficial to us. Well, there's so much of what you described that's so interesting to me. And I'd love just to start at the beginning. What were some of those issues or uh, struggles that you saw couples going through that were kind of tearing them apart that, that really was your motivation for entering the field? What I saw was a lot of people living parallel lives, um, not being present to their families, one person running this direction with this child for this activity. A lot of child, uh, child focus in the marriage where there was not a lot of relationship building amongst the couple. Just um, people not happy, just really running hard and, and living parallel lives. Some couples will come in and really they're done and counseling is just checking the box to say, well, I tried this and now, I, now I'm leaving. Other times people will come in wanting to, um, to grow. They can have a good marriage and just realize they have some areas where they need to work and they actually can communicate well. Other people come in and they believe they've married the wrong person. And so um, that just depends um, upon uh, the, the couple and what issue they're, they're presenting with, you know, where you'll hit on the issues. And it, it could be different for both people, even within the couple. What are some of the things that 
you're kind of thinking about in terms of your disposition or your mindsets as you prepare to enter a first session where you're not really sure what the couple is going to present to you or where they're at in their relationship? So my, I, I would say my mindset at that point is really one of openness and really seeking to understand um, and to listen and to, um, you know, of course, offer some, some hope and really looking at just at the dynamics of, of what's going on in the, the couple before me as a couple and then each person individually um, what I what I see. So it's just a time of really just seeking to know and to understand and to be open. Well, the installation of hope is so important in the counseling process, whether it's individual or couples or families. When you are working with a couple who is re- going through a really tough time and maybe it seems like there's one person who's given up Do you have any practical techniques or strategies that you implement to kind of help foster that sense of hope, even if it's only illustrated by your approach to the session? I think um, inherently, if someone is coming to the session, to me that says they're demonstrating hope. And I I would point that out and affirm them, you're coming. And um, I see that as as, um, a piece of hope that, that you have, that counseling will help you. I've noticed in my counseling that it's clear sometimes that each partner needs individual counseling or there are certain issues that need to be addressed individually that go beyond the scope of couples counseling. Uh, And one of the aspects of your training is uh, EMDR training. Do you ever encounter in your couple's work someone maybe who's been through trauma and you find the need to refer them to someone who maybe can treat that uh, in a more appropriate and specialized way? Yes, Um, I think it's very important um, when someone has experienced trauma, there's, there often would be a lack of safety for them in counseling. If they're continually being um, activated from you know, a past uh, trauma response. So yes, I think referring them to do their own work is very helpful. And the, the, uh, the partner in that relationship can, can also um, go in to understand the process that their partner is going through so that they can be supportive there is a, you know, a way to be supportive when you're, when you're working on EMDR. This may reflect just, I guess, my own ignorance uh, or my lack of knowledge about the various uh, modalities that counselors implement. But it seems only recently that I've kind of become more aware of EMDR, that it's received greater recognition, even though it's been around for like 25 years. And so you've been trained in that uh, modality for about 10 years, is it, I guess? Uh, yeah, I think I've, it's been over 10 years, yeah. And so 10 years ago, how did you become aware of EMDR and how did you decide that that was something that you wanted to learn more about? So I, we have to kind of back into this. Um, I started uh, my work in the field of domestic violence. You know, I wanted to um, help families and um, that was an opportunity that was available to me for my um, internship when I was in counseling school. And I only later came to realize that I actually did work with, was working with families just at the point where they really had broken down. Um, And so as I worked with, um, it was women in in a domestic violence shelter, as I worked with them, I realized that I needed some some more tools to help them process through um, the traumas that they had experienced. And so I had a professor who was one of the um, lead EMDR people in our area, in our state, in the Kansas City area, and he was an EMDR therapist, and that's where I first learned about it and then sought that training out for myself. And what I found out and discovered in using EMDR with my clients is that the reactivity from trauma, the hypervigilance goes away. And specifically when I started with many of, of the women in the shelter where I, where I first learned, what happened is that the distress would go down, but the positive beliefs that they would have about themselves, um, what they wanted to believe that originally felt completely false would feel true. Instead of just like maybe knowing cognitively that something was true, but it was really being able to embrace it and feel it that this was really true. Many times after processing, someone would come back and something that had been troubling them for years, they'd come back and say, no, you know, that's, that's over now. And so really just a freedom that people experience from things that are very disturbing. I noticed on the EMDR Institute's website that they recognize that that's kind of like the gold standard for treating severe trauma, but they also acknowledge that it's because it's been so effective with serious trauma, it's also incredibly impactful and 
effective technique for treating everyday issues, as they called them, uh, such as like low self-esteem or feeling powerless. Have you used EMDR to treat those issues with various clients? Yes, I have. When I, uh, when I learned EMDR, it, it changed a lot of how I, I, I work with people. And so you basically um, look for someone, uh, someone's, the early traumas, because they, there are neural networks um, that they connect into. And so, yes, I've worked with um, clients for relational traumas, you know, just um, issues of um, abandonment, for phobias, for um, all, all different uh, kinds of, of concerns. So it sounds like you've had a lot of positive experiences in addressing victims of trauma. What have been some of um, the greatest challenges and the greatest joys of working with victims of trauma? I'll start with um, some of the challenges. Some of the challenges are just a, a person's willingness to, to engage in, in the work because it's challenging and it, it's hard. And, and when people have long-standing uh, trauma, uh, years and years, and rooted in in childhood, it, it's just a challenging experience for them to to really engage in the work. And when they do, the the greatest joys and rewards are to see people who are really free from um, from the suffering that they had. Now you know it's like the layers of the onion. You you work and then you work again, but but step by step, as they experience freedom um, from certain things, then it just gives them that hope to keep going, that there is more healing for them. And so it's just very rewarding to have someone who's committed to the entire process and who will stay with it and work it through and experience um, really transforming life change. I guess I'd also want to ask, what are some of the joys and challenges of working with couples and families? The joys of working with uh, families is really seeing reconciliation between people and also um, helping them come to that place of understanding that they don't have to be able to solve all their problems, but that they need to learn to connect with each other in a positive way and learn to talk about those perpetual problems in a constructive way. And also um, helping them understand and when they realize, I didn't marry the wrong person. And so um, helping parents gain tools to engage positively with children is um, rewarding. Um, and I see that really as, as avoiding a, a lot of future problems and helping people connect and repair uh, those ruptured relationships and for them learning how to take those tools and to just take them into their, their daily lives. So I noticed in preparing for this interview, that you've had a chance to live all over the world. I've lived in, in three countries outside of the U.S. I first moved overseas 36 years ago, and it was when our oldest son was uh, six months old. So I think I really grew up in the Netherlands. I learned uh, to not be afraid um, to try of many things, but to try and speak Dutch. Um, I learned um, that I, I learned humility and to enter into all of the relationships there, realizing that I may not be fully understood and I might not fully understand them, but it was worth trying. And I learned that I could be connected to and learn from people who were very different from myself. Uh, later, um, my husband and I moved to England for six years with our three small children. And uh, at this point, I really grew in my faith and I built relationships with people in our small village. And then for the second half of that six year stint, we moved to an expat community and I saw how very differently people went through that experience. Uh, some families fell apart and others grew closer. Um, I saw people who had old wounds that resurfaced um, and other people really grew and flourished. And today our, our three sons um, are very close as is our, our family. Um, having lived through that experience together. And I also learned that there are many valuable cultures and many ways to do things, and that my thoughts and ideas are just that, they're mine and just one way. And I, I need to remain open to other people's experiences and ideas. And so this has helped me listen to and understand clients and students, and um, keeping an open mind and an open heart is important. Clearly your time in Europe was an incredibly formative experience. Did that time give you any insights into the practice of international counseling? Well, I'm not an expert in international counseling practices. In fact, uh, the word counselors, uh, we don't even exist in, in some countries. 
But our president, Dr. Samuel Gladding, uh, past president, Dr. Brandy Flamez, and Dr. Brian Canfield, who is our international committee chair, they are working tirelessly uh, to form partnerships and to offer trainings and to collaborate with professionals in many countries around the world. And my perspective is it's important um, to immerse yourself in another culture and ask what it is they need and listen first. And I think bringing in counseling services to new countries requires relationship building first, which is exactly what IAMFC is doing. And I also think uh, trust is critical. What drew you initially to wanting to get involved with IAMFC? Um, well, I wanted to be involved in IAMFC because of my passion for the family and for the positive role that it can be in our communities. And uh, because as like Dr. Virginia Satir might say, it's kind of that seat of people making and it's a place where hopefully we learn we're worthy of love and that we have our place in the world. Also, um, Dr. Brandy Flamez was my dissertation chair and she helped me get involved uh, volunteering for one of the conferences. And I really found a home amongst the members there and enjoyed uh, making a contribution to this organization and the profession. And it has really afforded me the opportunity to work alongside some great people and great leaders and innovators in our profession. Well, I'm still relatively new to the association. I'm still working on building those relationships. But I'm curious about what your experience has been specifically uh, with some of those mentors and leaders in the association that you've especially appreciated. Well, I think, um, after, first of all, I worked alongside uh, Dr. Jennifer Niven-Williamson, um, and she um, really trained me to organize the conference. So after that, experience, I gained some confidence in running for office um, as one of the main responsibilities is overseeing the conference. So it, for me, it was an opportunity really to give back to an organization that I believe uh, really works for our members and provides good opportunities to present and to attend um, really good learning sessions. Well, I have to admit that what initially drew me to the conference was just that I was a student and I didn't have a lot of time or extra money to go to conferences, and it just happened to be in the city that I studied and lived in. Uh, but they're like just experiencing the conference, there's so many great and exciting aspects of it. Since you've been so intimately involved, what are some of the aspects of the conference that you've especially enjoyed or found noteworthy? Well, one noteworthy aspect um, I th of our conference really is our partnership with the Military and Government Counseling Association. And um, Throughout um, our conference coming up in January and February, um, you'll see that there is a room that's designated for military educational sessions. And there's, if you want to work uh, with this population, topics this year run from preventing veteran suicide um, through couple and family therapy, um, research findings are presented, um, assessing through a multicultural lens, family reintegrations. Um, many sessions also to work with and support military spouses. Um, an additional strength in our conference is the outstanding leaders. Um, we have leaders in our organization that have relationships with professionals in our field. And through those associations, they bring in really wonderful leaders in our field to address our members. Um, this year, Dr. Mark Young is our keynote, and he will address the topic on fragile couples, fragile families. This year, our conference theme is Relational Issues in Couples and Family Counseling. And the, the strengths um, of our organization also include the strong committee volunteer base. This year, the conference committee has selected proposals, and we are offering eight different pre-learning institutes. And we also are offering uh, nearly 100 sessions, including educational sessions, roundtables, and... Um, poster presentations. Can you recall maybe feedback that you've received that's been positive or, or meaningful from the attendees or the presenters? Sure. Feedback that I have received from um, attendees of the conference has been that they, they enjoyed the sessions, that they were beneficial. I think it's always good when someone attends and they, they have tools that they can take into the office the next day. And so I'm, I'm always happy to hear that people have found the sessions to be um, rewarding. So if you wouldn't mind sharing just about strengths and opportunities offered by online programs or even your program in particular. So um, online counseling programs 
bring diversity to your program and the opportunity to engage with people uh, virtually, literally all over the world. And it provides the opportunity for educational development while working a full-time job or holding um, other responsibilities. Um, so I think it, it opens um, the educational experience and opportunity to more people than if, if everyone had to be in seat for their training. So yeah, they're certainly convenient, but also they're incredibly rigorous. What are some of maybe the common challenges or pitfalls that you've encountered in working as an online counselor educator? Um, online students need to be very disciplined. I encourage my students to plan ahead and read ahead so that they're fully prepared to be an active participant in the classroom. And online work requires daily work. Um, you really can't show up late or sit in the back of the classroom and not, have, not read the material. When you're online, especially when there's a synchronous element to it, it requires active engagement and preparation. I would say show up and be prepared and expect to work hard. Awesome. Telemental health, how did you get involved with uh, that modality since it, it still, for me, feels like it's on the cutting edge? The reason I got involved with telemental health years ago was um, because I was so far away from the U.S. when I, um, I was actually in Paris, France, when I was working on my Ph.D. through Walden University. And so that's what started my interest in, in distance counseling. Um, now the uh, NBCC's National uh, Distance Certified Counselor has been grandfathered into the Board Certified Telemental Health Credential. And so um, I, too, see this as cutting edge. And since our profession, both as counselors and educators, is a credentials business, um, I believe it's important to do all that you can do to prepare yourself uh, seeking supervision, extra education, and certification. So, um, so I've, I've done what I can do to be uh, prepared to work online. And um, so hopefully some of the, uh, the laws in our states will open up so that we can, for example, uh, work with a client uh, from our state when they're, when they're on vacation in another area to provide stability and, and continuity of care. You know, I, I do believe that it's the future. And I think the, um, the generation coming up now, uh, the millennial generation in particular, they are so engaged with technology and they understand it and are comfortable with it. And I think that it will uh, really break down barriers for people to get the help that they need. And um, when both the client and the counselor or the client or the student and the educator are comfortable with it, and, and then I think that it can be a, a positive experience, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. So do you have any knowledge or um, thoughts on the counseling that's like through text message or through email? Personally, I, I would not text, um, but I think that emails can be a um, very effective way to communicate because a client can take that information and read over it. And, you know, not everybody takes everything in in an auditory fashion, and some people are visual learners. And so um, I think you know, that, that can be very helpful. And just kind of in your experience with telemental health, what are some of the challenges or legal or ethical considerations related to this practice that novice counselors should be familiar with? There are a lot of challenges um, right now in distance work. First of all, in order to um, engage in ethical practice, you have got to make sure that you are following the laws of your state. Now, for example, the law of your state might say, you can work with anyone anywhere, but you would need to be aware of the laws of the state that the client is in. Issues of HIPAA compliance and confidentiality and secure communications are all areas of concern. You need to be sure that, um, that you're using technology that is secure, and you need to be sure that, that you are following the laws of the states and the countries even that you're um, practicing in or that your client is in. Also, um, being in a place that where a person has privacy when they're when they're talking is is important. Also, one of the challenges is you need to make sure that you are actually talking to the person you think you're talking to. So you need to uh, make sure you have proper identification. Also, you need to have uh, developed some supports and resources and emergency services in the location of where your client is living. 
And that would be regardless of, uh, that would be when working within the same state, you would need to have those resources. So anyway, there are some challenges. I think the, the military has uh, done some virtual work now, and they found that with the people needing services in rural areas, they've expanded um, their treatment to include telemental health. Um, so I think that they are leading us, leading the charge, so to speak, in, in this field and direction. And um, I think there's still some things to work out, but I'm encouraged that, um, that this um, would become a reality because I do think there are a lot of people who would, would get help through um, telemental health counseling. Thank you for sharing about that. I don't know if there's anything else that you would want to talk about or any other insights you'd want to share. Um, I did have something. I just, so I'll say it. So for those who are counselors and educators, I just want to encourage you and remind you how valuable uh, the work is that you do. You're helping people find healing, direction, purpose, or a new career even. Remember, in the busyness of your life and practice, remember to be present in your own life with your own friends and family. It'll make you a better counselor and a better counselor educator. Do you mind if I ask you to, to speak more about like the challenge of being present outside of counseling because it is so draining how much focus and attention and energy we give to our clients to kind of almost even hold that standard outside of sessions? I know I struggle with that tremendously. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, giving, giving that presence to your clients or your students um, and, and working really hard, um, it's easy to, um, to put those needs of the people in front of us um, first. However, there are people in our personal lives, our families and our friends, that need us to be present. And I, I think we have to first be present in our own lives to ourselves and not walk blindly through our own lives um, but I think we need to um, really practice that what we know is, is being present uh, with, with our families, making time to um, put aside the endless hours of paperwork so that we can uh, go for a walk. For me, it's spending time um, with my husband. It's just the two of us in the home now. It's spending time with my grandchildren and just closing the computer. And from um, this time to this time, I'm going to play on the floor and, and just be present and, and realize that I will return to my work as a better person for having spent this time with the people that I love and care for. Well, I don't know if you prepared ahead of time a, a reframe story, but I like to end every episode with a reframe. I did. <laughs> Okay, so I do have a reframe. After I had built up my practice, um, really a third time, my husband was offered a full-time job overseas, um, and I had to find new counselors for my clients, and I remember being disappointed having to let go and uh, not, not see them through further healing. And I felt sad, and I realized that I needed to trust that this opportunity for personal growth in my husband's life and in my life also meant that I could trust that this would also be a time of growing for my clients. So instead of it being a huge loss, I was able to embrace the opportunity before me. And not long after that, my PhD, which had been way on the back burner for a long time, it became a reality and I would not likely have pursued it without this change in our life. So today I'm a counselor educator because of that hard decision. So I would say be open to new opportunities even when they at first seem too costly. The Reframe is a production of the International Association of Marriage and Family Counselors. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. Join me next month on The Reframe.